Hey guys, welcome to another instalment for our own Your Own Economy group. And you may remember that I had John Adams join me back in around September last year. And so much water has um, passed under the bridge that I really wanted to uh, give John another opportunity to come back and, and talk to us and share some of his insight and wisdom. Uh, John is the uh, Chief of uh, Economist uh, for Adams Economics and also is very uh, influential and in, involved with As Good As Gold Australia, which is a silver and gold bullion dealer here in Australia. So he's a great resource for us. We really wanted to talk today a little bit about what's been happening, particularly with some hashtags that are that have appeared on Twitter in the last week or so uh, to do with silver, which is pretty hot. So without any further ado, I'd like to welcome you, uh, John. I'm going to unmute you now, if I can. It's not letting me, John. Oh, there you go. Can you hear me? There you go. Awesome. <coughs> Hey, welcome, John. Thanks for jumping into um, Own Your Own Economy with us. Thank you, Tanya, for having me. How are you going today? Really good. Uh, was interested in a little bit of uh, um, uh, in, uh, attention, let's say, that uh, Twitter got with this hashtag uh, Silver Squeeze. So I just think if you don't mind giving your thoughts on, you know, the build-up of what's been happening uh, in the last little while about silver... And really looking to help our um, our community here really discern through the noise. You know, there's so much noise going on at the moment. What's your take on what's going on? Is sure. You... Okay. Yeah, yeah. So now I've been buying silver for about uh, more than four years. I've been working in the industry for more than two and a half with, as, as you said in your introduction, with As Good As Gold Australia, so uh, as the chief economist. Now, um, one of the important things that your viewers need to understand is is that there are some specific markets around the world which are heavily manipulated mm -hmm. and the prices are heavily distorted and one of those markets is silver mm -hmm. and so the silver price is perhaps the most distorted market in the world um, the price uh, so so let me give an example the, the high of the silver market whether in US dollars or Australian dollars, was in 1980. And it reached, uh, I think, in US dollars, about $50 an ounce. And, and in Australian dollars, about $44 an ounce. Now, in 40 years, what's happened? We've, the global money supply has just exploded by, by, a, you know, by a huge factor. Um, and everything, in, this, uh, everything in, in Australia is more expensive relative to 1980, except for one thing, and that, and that is silver. And, and the reason is, is that the silver price is determined by um, a futures market in New York called the COMEX. Um, and the silver squeeze is really about trying to break this manipulation that's been happening. Now, um, people can go to my website, adamseconomics.com. They will find a range of articles that I've been publishing over the last few years about silver. Uh, there are a number of experts around the silver market around the world, and I'm in contact with quite a few of them. Um, and what me and some other people have been doing is actually documenting um, the, the unusual price, given the economic circumstances um, with all this. For example, in, even in terms of last uh, year, 2020, there was a huge amount of money printing by central banks. Um, and the price did go up you know, somewhat, but it's still well below um, where it was in, say, in 2011 or, uh, or in 1980. So um, a number of so there's you know so there's a number of experts around the world who have been documenting the corruption at the COMEX and the manipulation, and obviously when you have a price of anything that is suppressed down, what that means is there's a huge opportunity to make a lot more, a lot of money if that manipulation um, uh, if that corruption and that manipulation were to stop. So um, last year I wrote an article called George Soros and the Silver Moonshot. And basically, if if because I know that you're you were telling me before we started recording that a number of your um, audience members are you know uh, you know um, entrepreneurs and in, in terms of uh, business leaders etc. So for this sort of audience, a lot of um, people would, would understand basic uh, demand and supply, um, and you have an equilibrium price when demand equals supply. So um, 
you know, just putting my economics cap on for a second. So when you have a price ceiling, so the price is not allowed to go above a certain price, and that ceiling is below the equilibrium price, which is the price of what should be the price when demand equals supply. Um, <coughs> excuse me. When you remove that price ceiling, what happens to the price? it goes towards the equilibrium price. Um, and George, the reason why I titled the article George Soros and Silver Moonshot is that's what George Soros did in 1992 when he um, shorted the British pound because uh, the British pound was being um, kept at a value well above what the market said that it should be worth. Yeah. And when that, um, that uh, artificial uh, peg on the pound broke, Soros made more than a billion dollars within four weeks. Um, now he betted, he bet about $10 billion and he made a billion dollar profit. So um, now the, the silver market, th there's all sorts of estimates as to what the price should be um, in an unmanipulated market. Mm -hmm. So some of your viewers may be going trolling through YouTube and seeing stories of, um, so for example, today, silver is $27 an ounce US. Some people are talking about silver going to $50 or $100 or $200 or $600 or $1,000 or, or even higher than $1,000. So there's a lot of speculation as to, in an unmanipulated market, what is the price of silver? Um, I came up with some estimates last year based on 2019 data. And, and, and you know, about, uh, I would say 600 US, uh, 800 Australian, that, that seems to be a rough fair price. Mm -hmm. And how did I come up with that? Mm -hmm. So basically, you know, you can go, for example, to the Silver Institute and they give you estimates of, as to how much above ground available silver there is. Mm -hmm. And then you can compare that relative to the amount of money that's being printed in Australia vis-a-vis -vis the, um, the Australian money supply. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and when you do a rough calculation of total amount available silver divided by the amount of dollars available, I work it out to be about $800 an ounce. Um, and, 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 and so 800 Australian. So obviously that's a big difference. I mean, in Australian dollars, we're at about $35, $36 an ounce. And to go from 35, 36 up to 800, that, that's a, you know, but, you know, if you can um, marshal your resources in such a way that you can um, take a big position in silver, um, th th there's obviously a lot of potential to make a lot of money um, in a very short amount of time. And um, so obviously besides the silver squeeze hashtag, there's been a, you know, a lot of focus on GameStop. GameStop is, is a different situation in, in the sense that a lot of Wall Street hedge funds were betting that the price was going to go down and they had um, uh, the, these short positions, these short contracts, uh, promising that they would sell the price, uh, sell the share um, um, uh, at a particular price. And there was more contracts promising to sell shares uh, of GameStop more than there, there were shares available. And this uh, Wall Street Bets uh, Reddit group realized that if they, um, if they, basically started buying GameStop and pushing the price up because these short uh, sellers had these sell contracts, they would have to go into the market, buy the shares at a more expensive price in order to fill the, their short contract. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, if, and what they calculated was that if, if all of these people, um, if all of these hedge funds started, uh, you know, have to keep on chasing all these shares because all these other people are buying them, it was going to shoot the price up to a dramatic price. Uh, and that's basically why, um, say, at the 7th or 8th of January, um, the price was about, uh, I think, $17, $18 US a share. Mm -hmm. And it went up to all the way up to $483 a share. Um, because basically, um, this Reddit group started pushing up the price, then you started to get a whole bunch of other players in the market, pushing the price even higher. And then when the hedge fund started to buy the shares in order to fulfill their sales contract, uh, you just had a huge surge of money. I mean, the, the company's valuation went from about a billion dollars all the way up to about $25 billion within the space of three weeks. Mm -hmm. So you had $24 billion rushing in, in, into this one um, company's share price. Um, and for those who timed the market well and was able to buy loans so high, uh, they made a lot of money. Now, since then, I haven't checked the price today, but the price yesterday was about $60 US a share. So it went all the way up to 483, then it's basically crashed. So if you came into the party late, um, you didn't make a lot of money, um, uh, but obviously you came to the party early, I mean, you, you made a lot. So the, the key difference between say GameStop and Silver is Silver is a 
undervalued asset. And so if you um, if, if you actually squeeze, so the, the, when they talk about short squeeze, they're talking about there's a whole bunch of uh, bullion banks on this COMEX that have these short contracts promising to sell silver that they don't actually have. Mm -hmm. And the squeeze is to drain as much physical silver out of the market. So then when they have to comply with these um, uh, contracts where they have to deliver, they have to go out into the open market, uh, to the open physical market, and actually start buying silver in huge quantities at much much more expensive prices, in order to um, uh, get the price, in order to fulfill their contracts. And that process is going to send the price sky high. Uh, that's uh, for, for for anyone in your audience who's been following the palladium market. Um, very similar situation in 2017-18. Palladium had a huge um, short uh, concentrated short position on the COMEX. Um, they couldn't get enough palladium to, to fulfill their orders. The manipulation broke and the price of palladium went up 400%. Wow. So, so, that's, so, so that's what some people are expecting to happen in silver. Um, that's why I've uh, heavily invested in silver myself, both in, um, in terms of physical silver and silver mining shares. Yeah. And, um, and, and to, to a great extent, I've documented quite a bit of this on my website, um, uh, adamseconomics.com. I'm actually writing an article at the moment that I hope to publish later this week, which will actually document um, in some detail about the minute what by a minute blow about what's happened in the last two weeks. Okay. But 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 in terms of the last two weeks, I think a, key, a couple of, uh, <clears throat> of key factors is there's been huge amounts of unprecedented demand for physical silver, um, particularly at the retail level in North America. So the retail bullion dealerships across the US has been completely cleaned out. Mm -hmm. I know there's been strong buying um, in uh, Asia as well, uh, mm -hmm. as well as in some parts of Europe. Um, uh, even with uh, in the Australian market, as good as Australia, we've seen a huge um, pickup in silver sales as well. And I know some of our um, uh, other um, companies in the industry in Australia have also picked up in terms of silver sales. So that's um, one um, mm -hmm. big factor. But the other thing I think is important is, is that, <clears throat> for example, just like with this uh, Reddit group about GameStop, um, once you, once people start to become aware of, um, uh, in terms of the market, then then people, get, you know, pe more people get to learn about what's really happening in terms of, for example, the silver market, uh, the level of manipulation, the corruption, what's really happening with the price, um, who are the players in the market, and you know, one one of the big things that I think has been exposed in the last two weeks is these some of these ETFs which are controlled. Um, and managed by JP Morgan. So there's a... Um, so Let's there's talk a, about that a little bit. <laughs> sure. Good. So yes, so, so, so the major ETFs, there's a big ETF in gold called GLD and mm -hmm. there's a big uh, ETF in, in silver called SLV. Now SLV is managed by BlackRock, which is a huge head fund uh, headed by Ray Dalio and the custodian uh, is JP Morgan. And the custodian's role is to, so once they, when someone invests in this ETF and buy new shares, the, 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 what, what is required is that on the same day, silver is deposited in the vaults controlled by JP Morgan as the custodian um, in order to, because you're buying basically shares in a trust, which, which basically they promise are backed by physical silver. Mm -hmm. So within, so this, what this Reddit group was able to achieve is, a significant surge of money, um, and I don't think all the money was retail money because we're, we're talking, you know, in the billions of dollars. It looks like there were some um, big whales as well, mm -hmm. but uh, a lot of money went into this SLV over three days, mm -hmm. which required them to deposit 118 million ounces of silver into these vaults. And everyone who has experience in the silver market basically was scratching their heads and saying, "Well." There's no way they could have in, um, deposited 118 million ounces in, within three days. There's no way to source it and to physically actually move it in. Mm -hmm. so, so, so I think that uh, uh, a number of people are waking up to say, well, even, even not only at the COMEX with these futures of contracts, are there um, uh, problems of, of transparency and integrity around these contracts and, 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 and how the price is determined? Um, I think there are questions being asked about these ETFs and, and, and whether these people who say that they actually have the silver, um, you know, whether they actually have it. I mean, what typically happens when you have a huge Ponzi, Ponzi scheme is once the fraud is fully revealed, um, then, then um, it starts to all fall apart. Um, and then that's when you start to see some dramatic action. Yeah. 
in terms of price. So, so, yeah. so, 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 so that's what I think is the real story happening uh, with silver. Now, I should say that some people have been writing about the silver manipulation. There's one guy in America who's been writing about this for 35 years, so look all the way back into the 1980s. So this stuff has been well documented. Um, and I think more people are waking up. And the question is, how much longer do we have to wait until that point at which the price is going to explode? Um, some of the long time people in the industry think that we're very close. Could be weeks, could be um, two or three quarters, but but I do think that as more attention is put on the silver market, as more people buy physical silver, we're going to reach that point in time which um, the, uh, the 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 um, the the the, the bullion banks who have to satisfy these contracts, they're going to be forced to scramble and push the price up in order to, to get enough silver to, to meet these contracts. And those who are positioned correctly, just like with Palladium, just like with GameStop, I think they're going to make a lot of money. Wow, that's great, John. Thank you. That's um, amazing information. I've got a basic question, actually, which has got to do with the practicals. You know, I get a lot of phone calls from people, um, if, you know, just talking about where they you know, retain the earnings, what do they, how do they convert their fiat currency, what can they do? So a couple of questions. One, the difference between bullion and the coins, right, and... Um, and you know your ideas on that, and perhaps if you're happy to share, you know your preference there, and give a bit of an understanding. The other one's storage. I often get, you know, people understand. Okay, I've got to move into some, um, you know, physical. Where do I store it? And 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 um, and you know, we've been around this for a little while, but for people watching this, there um, these are common questions. I'd, I'd love your views on on both of those, if you don't mind. Sure, sure. So, so in terms of the first question, in terms of well, so when you say bullion, I'm sure I'm assuming you mean like in terms of bars. Yeah. I, I mean, the, look, I think the most important point that people need to understand is, particularly in terms of Australia. So, investment grade silver or investment grade bullion is basically 99.9 or 99.99 percent pure uh, gold or silver. So, so, so I think people should be focused about the um, purity of the silver and the integrity of the product. Um, and you know, I know that with As Good As Gold Australia, we only sell three nines or four nines in terms of the quality of our bars. And, um, uh, and, 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 and obviously there are a whole host of private um, sector mints, uh, both here in Australia and North America that produce coins and bars. Uh, and then we obviously have uh, you know, like a, a whole host of government organizations, uh, you know, various mints, you know, Canadian mint, US mint, Perth mint, et cetera, who, who produce, uh, you know, bars and coins as well. So um, so as long as it's, uh, it's actual genuine silver and it's 99.9 or 99.99% pure gold or silver, I, I, think, I think that's the, the most important thing. Uh, I do get questions from customers from time to time who want to ask questions about bars versus coins. And, and really I say to people, it depends why you're buying. So if you're buying gold or silver, particularly silver, because you want to preserve your wealth, uh, you're better off buying larger denominations of bars, like kilo bars or the 100 ounce bars, etc., because you're going to get a better bang for, for like a better bang for your buck. Mm -hmm. If you think that things are, are going to be so dire with the economy, with runaway inflation, that you may want to use the silver to trade, to buy goods or services, whether it's food or uh, you know small products or etc., whatever the case may be, you're better off buying coins. I mean, I've seen pictures on the internet where, for example, in Venezuela, where they've got hyperinflation, someone may have a kilo of silver, they're not going to hand over the kilo to, to, in order to buy food. So they don't have coins, they don't have the ability to melt the silver down. Uh, and then in terms of refining it. So, so what they'll do is actually get a hacksaw and hack a bit of the silver off. <laughs> um, um, and, and so, yeah, so look, it, it, to be honest, it's a very ugly process. It looks <laughs> Uh, you know, it's a very probably intensive process as well. Um, but 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 there are some people who, you know, if they are desperate to actually go buy some stuff, they'll they'll do some they'll do that sort of thing. So uh, the written out the bulk of my holdings is in actually you know kilo bars, but I do have um, a whole host of ten ounce bars and some coins as well. And the coins are really there as a, an insurance policy that if something was to happen, like in terms of um, extreme runaway inflation that I actually have coins that I can actually use to actually trade. So, so, so that, that's what I think is the most important element between bars versus coins. Yeah, great insight there. And then on the storage side, uh, how does that sure. work here? 
Yeah, yeah, sure. And so, so in terms of storage, yeah. so yeah. Um, now, in terms of as good as gold Australia, I mean, we, the only thing we sell is actual physical gold and physical silver. So we don't do uh, paper contracts, unallocated, anything like that. So uh, we, we have a number of options for, for clients. Sometimes we have clients who have asked us to, uh, we, they want to physically receive um, their gold or silver at a residential address or a work address or a business address. And uh, so we're able to make that happen through a secure courier you, uh, that, that, that is insured. Um, and you know, let me give you an example. Uh, several years ago, I had um, a customer who bought a uh, half a ton of silver, uh, a very, very large order. And uh, he had uh, the facility to store it. And he said, I want you to deliver me 500 kilos of silver. So, we, you know, uh, there was a bit of a logistical challenge, but we made that happen. And, and everyone was, w w was happy in the end. Um, sometimes we, we have clients who want to buy a small amount of silver, but because they are renting, and they're not allowed to put a safe in their premises because the landlord won't allow it. That you know, um, that they they sometimes they'll say, okay, I'll, I'll receive it, or sometimes they say we we want we need a storage option. So, if you physically don't have the ability to to, to take receipt, um, then the, then there are some um, uh, then there are some options. Uh, as good as gold, we run a vaulting option in um, Adelaide um, that we vault for both domestic and international clients. And so um, uh, if you wish to uh, vault uh, with us in Adelaide, <laughs> if you want to do that, you can. There are some non-government, non-bank vaulting private services across the country. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we have uh, relationships with several of them in uh, Brisbane, Sydney, and Melbourne. Uh, and we can help, uh, we, we've helped numerous customers who have bought from us, but wanted to store in the local capital city. So we're able to have help there. Um, so th there are some times we get clients who say to me, um, I'm just not sure about the Australian government, where they're going. Um, I don't trust these Australian politicians. I want to store some of my gold or silver offshore. So mm -hmm. we have relationships in Singapore and Switzerland and North America. And if a customer says to us, I want to, you know, store some in Australia, I want to store some in Singapore or Switzerland or places overseas, you know, we have those relationships so we can help the customers in terms of those various, uh, uh, in terms of those vaulting options. The only thing I, I would recommend is, is that avoid vaulting with banks, avoid, uh, avoid vaulting with, uh, in terms of the government organisation, because there have been historical examples like for example with uh, President Roosevelt in the 1930s in America where there has been gold confiscation so um, yeah, um, obviously where you can avoid uh, storing it with some with an obvious entity um, like a government vault um, then then you have a better chance of um, trying to protect your wealth if there was ever any disastrous uh, confiscation program that the government wanted to implement yeah fantastic John thank you so much. I know that you've been, uh, we'll make sure that there's a link um, when I post this in the group where people can, you know, um, find out more and if they want to contact you directly, they can if they've got more questions. So that's great. So I know you've been writing a, a long time about, you know, fina financial Armageddon. So this is sort of a questions without notice here. So um, how, wherever you want to take this. And of course, you know, a lot of the research too around the property market and, and that kind of thing and what we would have anticipated in normal non-manipulated circumstances of what, you know, sound, um, you know, this foundational uh, cause and effect of what we could have anticipated would happen with things like, you know, the bug, shall we say, and then, you know, what's been happening with the global economy. Mm -hmm. For those people watching this saying, look, you guys are just, you're off your rocket, Tanya. You, um, you know, you're, you're you're worrying too much. You know, the government's um, going to save us. They're printing a lot of money, and um, uh, everything's going to be okay. You know, the, the housing prices are booming, and uh, you know, we've got record pricing. What are you worried about? The, the market's, you know, safe. Um, what would your um, commentary be to someone that's um, on that side of the curve, just to to give them another view, John? Sure, sure. So, so before COVID-19, I mean, I was writing extensively about 
uh, in terms of the Australian context, where we've got a household debt bubble, we've got a foreign debt bubble. So when I when I use the word bubble, what do I mean is is that we've got so much debt that 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 it's not normal, you know, um, you know, uh, it's not normal consistent with what other countries are experiencing uh, in terms of relative metrics. Whether you want to look at the debt to G, household debt to GDP or uh, household income, and, and uh, like you know, and comparing that in terms of household debt, etc. So there's a whole host of metrics you can look at both from a comparing Australia to other countries or comparing Australia to, you know, um, in terms of Australian history. And you realise that the amount of debt that households are carrying at an individual level, as well as what households at a macro level is holding uh, in terms of household debt. And then obviously when you look at foreign debt, uh, th these are not normal um, and, and, and we're at a very dangerous level. So, um, uh, when you see these, you know, huge bubble type of behavior in data, then you start to say, well, when this has happened in the past, what's happened? Typically, what's happened is you have an economic crisis. Um, so whether it's the GFC, whether it's like the, you know, the popping of the uh, Irish housing bubble in 2008 or the US uh, housing bubble or um, the Great Depression or the Depression of 1892 in Melbourne, etc. I mean, there are some clear examples of where you have, when people have too much debt and you have a bubble, that bubble can pop. Now, in 2018, I published an article called The Six Pathways to Australia's Economic Armageddon, which is with news.com.au. Mm -hmm. And I outlined six scenarios of where I thought this Armageddon scenario was going to. Mm -hmm. Three of the scenarios were around deflation. And deflation basically means is um, if the amount of debt and money in the system shrinks, then you're going to start to see rapidly decreasing amount of uh, asset prices, you're going to start to see bankruptcies, uh, you're going to start to see banks getting into trouble. Um, so, so the first three scenarios were around that basic concept. And the last three scenarios were around, well, if they keep on printing and spending money to stop the bubble from imploding, uh, we're not going to have deflation, we're going to have an inflation problem. And, um, and, and, and so one of the three inflation scenarios I outlined in my uh, six scenario model was about stagflation. And so last year, um, um, I came out and said that Australia is experiencing stagflation. And stagflation is typically uh, something we went through in the 1970s across the world, which is low economic growth, relatively high unemployment and rising prices. Um, stagflation is pretty much, um, it, it's not supposed to happen according to the textbook. Typically when unemployment goes up, it goes up because um, demand has been reduced. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, yeah, I mean, yes. So, so, so demand has been reduced, and when demand reduces, prices are supposed to fall. So you're not supposed to see rising prices and rising unemployment at the same time. But that's what happened in the 1970s, and we we clearly started to see that last year, as the money supply in Australia, you know, started to go berserk. At the same time, unemployment was rising, and 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 we had uh, you know uh, we had an economic recession with, with economic growth being negative. So that was a phenomenon that was taking place in Australia in 2020. That was happening in the US, uh, and, and that was happening uh, right across the world. So uh, going into 2021, um, if people go to my website, I've just published an article this week saying that uh, Joe Biden is going to accelerate stagflation. Mm -hmm. so, so this stagflation process that I just outlined, it's gonna get, it's gonna, it's gonna get faster. And, 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 and I'll give some specific examples as to why that's gonna happen. So the first thing is, is that the Biden administration is going to, um, uh, they're looking to spend an, uh, initially $1.9 trillion. So think about it with a T, trillion dollars uh, in terms of COVID-19 relief. So when Trump um, came into the White House, uh, uh, you know, um, I think U.S. government debt was around nearly not, um, 18 and a half trillion dollars. Uh, when Trump walked out of the White House, it was almost 27 trillion. The Biden, and, and I should say, Trump uh, incurred the most debt in a four-year period in the history of the United States, um, and and that was something I obviously didn't support um, in terms of what he was up to. Yeah. Uh, but but Biden has uh, basically um, um, uh, he he's now. Um, incurring. So on top of the existing debt in, in terms of the existing deficit they can inherited from Trump, he's now proposed a new $1.9 trillion stimulus package, um, which has passed the US uh, Senate. And, and I think it's still, it's still to go through the US House of Representatives. Um, separate to that, he's, he's proposed spending $2 trillion on 
um, uh, on climate change uh, action uh, on clean energy and uh, new infrastructure. So he's pro effectively proposing $4 trillion of new spending. That requires the, the, the you know, in order to raise that money, they've got to sell more bonds. Um, and how that how those bonds are going to be bought? They're going to be bought by the central bank, and that means more money printing. So um, the Trump was able to uh, shrink the so the U.S. Just to give some context, so the U.S. Federal Reserve, the the America's central bank, before the GFC, their balance sheet was eight hundred billion dollars. Um, through the GFC and then through Obama, it went from eight hundred billion to four and a half trillion. The first two and a half years of the Trump administration, they were able to shrink that balance sheet all the way down to 3.8 trillion. And then when Trump left office, it, it exploded up to $7.4 trillion. So um, when you start to look at <coughs> the amount of money sloshing around in the financial system and see, you're seeing hedge funds bet you know, billions of dollars on, on you know, speculation of, uh, on share prices like GameStop, all of this has been printed money out of nothing um, and this has been created by the central banks. And so, um, that balance sheet, which is now 7.4 trillion, I'm expecting that over the next four years under Biden, that's going to explode quite highly because of all this new spending that they're coming through. So that's um, the first way that they're going to make stagflation go faster. The other way they're going to make it go faster is um, that you know Biden has come in with a whole suite of executive orders, which is going to cost a lot of American jobs. Um, and and, and it, things from like uh, signing up, re-signing to the Paris Climate Accord, which imposes significant uh, restrictions on American industry, to um, uh, you know they have cancelled construction on the border wall between America and Mexico, which is a, which was a Trump project, and that's going to cost thousands of jobs. You've got the XL uh, Keystone Pipeline, which is costing a thousand, uh, like uh, thousands of jobs as well, tens of thousands of jobs. You've got the prohibition on fracking um, on federal property, uh, and that was a big, uh, you know, there was a huge explosion of oil and gas production under the Trump administration, and a lot of jobs being created there, and a lot of the jobs are now basically going. So, uh, and then, and then obviously, it still hasn't become law, but they're proposing a fifteen dollar minimum wage in America, which is going to cost uh, a lot of jobs as well, and it's going to quicken the process of automation. So, so between this new spending and this more money printing, which is extreme by any stretch of the imagination, at the same time they're introducing a whole host of new laws and new regulations, which are going to which are going to raise the which is either going to ban jobs because they're banning certain activities, or they're going to make it more costly to actually hire people. You're going to start to see rising um, both unemployment in terms of underemployment. So, so I think the combination of the two is going to lead to this, uh, you know, stagflation becoming a faster process in 2021, 2022. And, and what stagflation really means is, is that if you are a middle class uh, household, it means that your budget is going to get squeezed. So it means that your income could be either, you know, it could be reduced because you've either lost your job or you've gone from full time to part time to casual, or it means that um, wages growth, um, you know, it, it could be stagnant at the same time that prices are rising and now um, prices uh, you know were quite flat last year because of the recession and COVID-19 but in the last uh, few weeks we're already starting to see on the international commodity markets certain prices are starting to go up quite quickly for example in the last couple of weeks the price of oil has gone up by about 10 percent uh, the price of lumber the price of uh, you know uh, corn the, the, the price of wheat on some of these international commodity markets, um, that they, they are going up quite aggressively. And uh, any time that you, you start to see the, the the cost of or the price of raw materials going up, that's going to start feeding through um, the economy, and you're going to start to see price rises uh, happening, um, uh, whether they're for business uh, goods or consumer goods. So, so that process is still to play out. But I think with all this uh, money printing, uh, with all this additional stimulus with the, um, the, the, the financial markets and the commodity markets starting to respond, I think we're going to see inflation pick up. And the other thing I will point out is that even the United States, as well as in New Zealand, they, they measure inflation expectations. And in both countries, expectations around inflation, you know, I mean, that the, the expectations are going up. It is going up as well. So um, uh, in this environment, um, um, you know, 
what, what you know the, the most important thing to, for people to protect is you know what like a, what a couple of things one is to protect their cash flow because cash flows can easily be squeezed and you've got to think of how do you ensure that you can get, you know, that you can maintain your living standards and uh, and that you can that you can afford the not only the basics but the lifestyle that you want but the other important thing is how do you protect your wealth and um uh, in, in 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 the 1970s the 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 two key assets that were best in terms of protecting purchasing power and wealth was gold and silver. Uh, and even if you look at what happened in 2020, even though um, uh, the market is manipulated, gold in Australian dollar terms still went up about 13.7% mm. uh, and silver went up 32% last year. Mm. And, and when you compare that compared to your traditional asset classes like cash bonds, uh, real estate and shares, uh, gold or silver had a phenomenal year and they did what they're supposed to do when you have stagflation. Now, the only uh, other thing that outperformed gold and silver last year was cryptocurrencies. And, and you know, we, you know, I mean, Bitcoin went up, I think, uh, 250% last year. Ethereum went up 300%. Um, and we're obviously seeing in the first, uh, you know, six weeks of 2021, Bitcoin um, going up quite aggressively and quite a few of these other cryptocurrencies, they're also going up as well. Yeah. I'd like to talk to you more about that. We can do that. We can link that in next episode and see um, which other tech companies have perhaps bought crypto or making them more mainstream. I want to thank you, John, because you always pack a punch and you always bring massive value. And for my audience in particular who are super busy, you know, running their businesses and you know, dealing with staff and that kind of thing, with all the craziness of what's been happening, you know, these updates are really, really valuable. So I want to thank you on behalf of my community and uh, we'll make sure that we put your details at the bottom of this. So if they want to reach out, they can let you know that they saw you uh, with Tanya on Own Your Own Economy and then you know um, you know, uh, what they were listening to. And perhaps we can do this you know, once a quarter with these updates and um, in between time they might want to jump on your newsletter or your website. Thank you very much. Sure. Um... Yeah. Yeah, look, that, that, that is not a problem and I'm always happy to help. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much for that update, John, and look forward to talking to you uh, next time. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much.